Welcome. Thank you all for coming. It's, uh, it's just good to see like a full class or more. That's, that's pretty great. Especially when we're dealing with a topic like this. It can be intimidating for some people, improvisation. It's hard. Um, especially, I think, the like classical music used to have a, a very rich tradition of improvisation, and it got lost somewhere in the 18th, late 18th, early 19th century. Um, and so classical musicians in general, and I include myself from, uh, among them, like in the beginning, when I first transitioned to more improvisational styles of music, improvisation was very intimidating to me. It seemed like, like how can you make music on the spot? But, and, and part of that comes from improvisers' own doing, like a lot of musicians, especially in the, in the early days of jazz, um, they, they had this mystical aura to them, and it was like, oh, well, to do what they do, you have to like be one of those magical people. But in reality, that's what well, we improvise all the time. I think anybody can improvise. Because unless you're the kind of person that like writes a script for every single interaction that you have with another human being, which I don't know anybody who does that, um, like you, you improvise all the time. You know, the, yeah, maybe you have pre-scripted, you know, you say hello to somebody, you say, hey, how you doing? And then everything that happens after that, it's improvised. It depends on what the other person does. So if you can have a conversation, you can improvise. It's just a matter of learning the language in your, in your instrument and learning how to do it. Um, so that being said, improvisation is a really vast topic. So I can't cover it. Even, in, even if I had two hours today, I wouldn't be able to cover it all. So I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have some constraints in what I'm going to be covering. Um, some of the preliminaries, um, we have the basic sounds in music. There's, there's tons of sounds in terms of chords and chord functions and stuff like that. If you sat through my music theory masterclass, you know some of those things. Um, <coughs> and, uh, and or if you are one of my students, like you guys know, like there's all kinds of chords that, that I talk about in chord types. But today we're only gonna look at the three main types that you are bound to see in a, um, in a piece of music. And that is the major sound. So that could be like your basic, you know, cowboy C chord. Right, your C chord. Uh, what I have in the paper that is an example of the A shape for C major seven. That chord. If you like Red Hot Chili Peppers, that's the chord that they play in Under the Bridge. C major seven. You play it in E though. But it's the same chord, same voice. Then we have the uh, dominant seven voicing, which is the same thing, exactly the same chord. And I, I deliberately use the same shape so you guys can see the difference in the chords themselves. If I use a chord like this, then when I play the minor version, dominant version, they're all gonna look different. But you can see the voices moving when I go from a major seven chord to a dominant seven. Notice that the only thing that changes is that my third string goes down a half step. So I lift my middle finger, right? So I end up with this sound. And then to do a, a minor seven chord, all I have to do is now my third, my pinky is gonna lift and my middle finger is gonna come there onto the fourth chord. So now my third move down a half step and I end up with the minor seven sound. So I have major seven, dominant seven, and minor seven. And with those three sounds, you can already make music. Um, a lot of, you could play a song like Autumn Leaves Right, the jazz standard. You, you could play it with just, you know, it's a minor chord. You have A minor 7, D7, so that's a dominant 7 chord, a major 7 chord, G major 7, another major 7 chord, C major 7. We have the minor 7 flat 5, forget about that one. We're, gonna talk, we're not going to talk about that one. Dominant 7 again. So that so with those three sounds we can play definitely all pop music and uh, and most jazz. What makes it more important to be able to play jazz? Um, and then below that we have some of the other sounds that we're not going to talk about today, but I thought it were worth mentioning, like the minor major seven chord. That's that James Bond sounding chord, which is this one. Then we 
have our um, minor seven flat five, which is the chord that I said we weren't going to talk about, which is this one. Functions is a two in a minor key. Um, seven flat five, which is an, one of the alter dominants. There are other like flat nine, sharp nine, sharp sharp five, and then com any combination of those alter uh, degrees, like sharp five and flat five, sharp nine, flat nine, and you can put them in any order you want. So think all the combinations that you have all the alter dominant chords there. And uh, then we have our major uh, major seven sharp five, which is, it's kind of related to the augmented chord. I don't think, I don't think of this chord as an augmented chord. This is a music theory side. I promised you I wasn't gonna do these ones, but I have to talk about this. Um, I, I think of the, the augmented chord as a symmetrical chord, right? Because we are stacking major thirds, right? And then if I keep stacking, uh, I end up where I started, right? So I have a major third going from C to E, another major third going from E to G sharp, and then another major third going from uh, G sharp to C, right? Which would be B sharp, but you know, it's the same note as C. So, that's an augmented chord. The the seven the major seven sharp five chord kind of like breaks that symmetry because now your your interval construction is different. So even though it's a similar sound, I, I don't think of it as a chord that's connected to the to the augmented chord, but it's kind of like its own entity. It's like a Lydian sharp five chord. And I know like if you know what I'm talking about, just forget about it. We'll we'll cover those things with uh, some of the exotic skills and everything. And then of course. We need the diminished chord, right? So the diminished seven chord, which is a, a very important chord. It shows up in uh, all kinds of things in, in music. It's, it's the seven in a minor key. Um, and we also use it uh, as a substitution for the five. So then we, we can use that to kind of create chromatic lines moving from one chord to another. So if I'm playing say a C major seven, there it is, C major seven. I could play say a C sharp uh, diminished seven as a connection to a to a D minor seven. So we'll take what would be a very simple kind of boring chord progression. And I'm just kind of moving up the scale. And now I'm by adding that diminished chord in between, I create harmonic interest. Because so I'm going, or maybe I'm going two, and then I go here. Now that's pulling you hard towards that chord. And then if I do it again, that pulls you hard into the next chord. So then now you're creating harmonic interest and you're also creating a chromatic bass line and I'm a fan. I like so, the chromatic bass line. So what you do is just going up the neck right now? Basically, yeah. And that's just one example of how you'd use a diminished uh, seventh chord. Um, and there's, there's tons of the sounds, like I said, but if I keep talking about that, we'll just spend an hour talking about chords and we'll never move on, so I'm gonna stop. Um, then the other sound that I want you guys to be familiar with is the pentatonic scale. Right? If you're a guitar player and you play rock or blues, you know what this scale is. This was it already. If you're my student, I made you learn all five shapes, so you know them. And then, uh, and then we also have the, um, I don't need to say much about that scale, it has Five notes is like a, uh, you can think of it as a, ma as a major scale or a minor scale, depending on, on which note you're, you're centering it around in terms of application. Uh, and it's basically a diatonic scale, major or natural minor scale, that's missing two notes. So you go from seven to five, that's, that's why it's called pentatonic. There's a ton of history behind that scale, but I'm not gonna go into that. Uh, then we have the major scale. The major scale is the scale that you find when you sit on a piano and you play all the white notes. So that's and this position affords you two octaves um, of that scale. So, uh, so with so those, the whole steps. no, you're gonna get all the white notes. So you're you're gonna have whole steps and half steps because if you know the formula of the major scale, it's gonna be whole step, whole step, half step, right? Because like if you can visualize a piano between E and F, you don't have a black key. And between B and C, you don't have a black key. So those two those two keys are a half step apart. So you're gonna end up with a formula that's like whole step, whole step, half step, and then whole step, whole step, whole step, half step, which is a formula for the major scale. So 
even though you are playing all the white keys, all the natural notes, no sharps or flats, um, you, um, you are still playing half steps because that's built into uh, the major scale. Um, yeah, and then once again, just like we have tons of other chords, we have, we have tons of other scales. So if you learn, and I'm not talking about modal scales, because like you know that, you may not know this, but the major scale has seven different modes, right? And the so-called Gregorian modes, where if you center the scale around the, like the second node, you get Dorian, and the third node, you get Phrygian, and then you have Lydian, Mixolydian, uh, Aeolian, which is the same as natural minor, and then Locrian, if you build it on the seventh uh, degree. But that's not what I'm talking about. There's, there are unique scales that have unique formulas that are very different from the major scales. Like uh, the Hungarian minor, for instance, is a scale that uh, um, it ends up being like a, a harmonic, no, melodic minor scale with a raised fourth. So you end up with this, with this really interesting uh, sounding scale that I'm not gonna play. And then you have all these other like modal scales and all the modes of the harmonic minor, the melodic minor. So the, so the, the scales that you can think of as conventional uh, yes. Is there any like good like place maybe on the internet to get like a reference sheet for all the different scales and their uh, uniquity, uniqueities? I mean, you should probably get uh, one of the books in the in the recommended reading in the in the back of the page. I kind of covered some of that stuff. The Mark Levin uh, Jazz Music Theory uh, book. It's a it's a pretty comprehensive resource when it comes to uh, scales. If you wanna look at some of the exotic scales and you just don't care about the theory behind it, you just want a, like a, a list of the scales, the grimoire of uh, scales and modes, it's another good choice. It doesn't explain anything about what the modes do or how to use them, but you have all the fingerings listed. So it's a pretty, it's, it's, I think books like that are to music what a dictionary is to language. Mm -hmm. it, they're good to have, and it, it's good reference material. Mm -hmm. Um, it's not going to teach you how to construct a sentence. Exactly, yeah. Exactly, it's just reference material. Um, cool. Okay, so then, then we have a matter at hand, which is actually improvisation. How do, how do we approach improvisation? The, and and not, I, don't, I don't consider any of these approaches better than the other. They're, they're, I think they're all equally good. Um, the, the application is a little bit different. I think uh, some some forms and some songs might be uh, better suited for one approach versus the other. Um, and I'm going to try to like, give you guys an example of like all of them so you can kind of see. So um, when, we, when we look at the tonal center uh, approach is when you take, so you have say a song that has like a bunch of chords and uh, as songs tend to have. <laughs> and uh, and, and what you do is you group the chords, as many of the chords as possible, into the same tonal center or key, right? And that's how most of us begin, right? You, you look at a song and, you know, you want to, it could be a rock song or something, and you're like, oh, well, let's learn the guitar solo. What key is that song in? Mm -hmm. Oh, it's in E minor, because everything is in E minor. Mm -hmm. So then it's like, all right, well, now I can play the E minor pentatonic scale, and you just noodle around with the minor pentatonic scale, and then you rock, and then it's awesome, right? Well, and, and, but that approach is not just for like a beginner song. You can take a jazz standard and- How, how do you tell what key it's in? Uh, it's an excellent question. You need to do some analysis mm -hmm. of the material. So you, you look at the song and uh, um, and you look at the, the chord progression, like how the chords are um, they are set and how they're working from, from one place to another. So you have to understand a little bit about chord function and how they work. And then um, a good way to sort of like find your tonal center is you find the five, which is usually a dominant chord. And if the five is resolving, and, and this is kind of falling a little bit outside of what we're gonna talk about today, but uh, but if the five is resolving uh, up by a perfect chord, so like say you have a G7 resolving to a C or a, a B flat seven resolving to A flat, you know, whatever, then you can work your way back and find the key of the song. Because usually you can be like, okay, so you have say, B flat, and then you're going back to a to an E flat major. So B flat to E flat major. You can pretty confidently think like, oh, well, maybe this is the one, right? In that specific portion of the song. And it's okay. So, so I'm going from five to one. So what came before it? And then if you find say 
um, an F minor. So you're going. So how many different keys are there? Is it one for every single note? Like, you know, there's twelve. Well, there's fifteen different keys. Twelve sounds, but fifteen keys because what you end up with is um, um, seven sharp keys, seven flat keys, and then the key of C, which is the natural key. So you end up with fifteen keys, but the chromatic scale only has twelve tones. So you're going to end up with um, keys or notes that are going to have the same name. That's what the enharmonic equivalent is. With the key determine like what the general shape or part of the fretboard it's on? Not necessarily. What what the key is gonna determine is what notes you, are you essentially allowed to play. Mm -hmm. You can bend the rules later, but for now let's just say like, oh we're constrained by a diatonic system, we can't play any chromatic notes. Then okay, then then the, the key is gonna dictate what notes and what chords more importantly mm -hmm. you can play um so with that specific so subset. Learn a rule so you break them thing. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly how music works. You start out learning the rules, and then we begin to learn how to bend them and eventually break them. And then it's like, now oh, you can play whatever you want, mm -hmm. but because you know how to make it sound good. Mm -hmm. So so that's one example, right? So you have you could have a song, and you're playing it. But even if you have something like a standard, like uh, um, even though we're playing Blue Boss earlier, um, that that mm -hmm. song, if, if you look at the chord progression, and I'll see how much of it. <laughs> So the chord progression of Blue Bosa, right? We have a C minor for two measures, C minor seven. So we have one, two measures of that. Then we have F minor seven for two measures. At least I think that's right. And then we have D minor seven flat five, which we're not going to talk about for one measure. Then we have uh, G7 sharp five, which we're also not going to talk about. It's basically a function of the five of the dominant chord. And then back to C minor seven. These are all the keys? No, no, these are just the chords. Yeah, the chords of the song, right? And then we have D flat minor seven. Four, I think. Then A flat seven. D flat major seven. Somebody will remember all this. You're just telling us that this isn't a punk song. <laughs> D minor seven flat five. And then we have G seven sharp five to C minor seven. And then the turnaround is gonna be D minor seven flat five and G seven sharp five on the same measure. And then we start over. I think that's about how the lead sheet goes. So <clears throat> if you look at it like this, it can be intimidating because like, oh, there's so many chords, how do I play like everything? And then if you try to look at the key, you have like chords that fall outside of the key. So it, it makes it tough. So then what what helps for a couple of those modulations? Yeah, right here. Yeah. So what helps is to kind of divide the song, and I'm gonna I'm gonna cheat and uh, and just tell you guys without going through the process. Because then that's a whole other topic, is analysis and breaking everything down. So I'm just gonna tell you that this half of the song is in C minor. This little bit right here is in E flat minor. Oops, turn right. It's in E flat minor. And this part right here, like three steps over there, but. Uh, we can bend the rules there. And this part right here is back to C minor. So by like essentially grouping the chords all together and being like, okay, well, I can play the C minor scale through this entire thing. And then when this changes, I'll just change to the E, mi e minor, E flat minor scale. And then I go back to C minor. I just simplify the scale because I only have one change mm -hmm. that I have to make. So I have a song that's relatively complex. Are those real, is that the relative minor or C? No, no. Okay. no, they're completely unrelated. All right, cool. I mean, well, they're related in the sense that it's like you could call it, it's like kind of a chromatic median, but mm -hmm. no, not really because the chromatic median tends to be the sixth. Mm -hmm. But there's a relationship there. Yeah, for sure. Enough for it to work in the same song. Exactly, yeah. yeah. If that major would be the relative 
a major of C minor. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but this is E flat minor. That's right, that's right. So, um, so Eva, can you come up here? same concepts that you would use in rock mm -hmm. and just be like all right well, it's in c minor i'm gonna play the c minor pentatonic mm -hmm. and then it changes to e flat i'm gonna play the e flat minor pentatonic and your notes are gonna fit mm -hmm. the, the only thing that's gonna change of course is is the, the idiom that you're using right what, what idiomatic expressions are you using in your music when you're improvising if you're playing over a blues if you're playing over a like if you're playing jazz or if you're playing rock mm -hmm. Um, you were just only playing C minor and, C, and E minor. C minor and, and, e, and E flat minor, yeah, first, and then I played the pentatonic scale, and I just and I kept it stuck too. I yeah. didn't even. I went one right. box to the next yeah. box. It's always awesome. I love how uh, chord changes can be, even though they're big and not melodic, they kind of are melodic in just a bigger way, and that's where most of those, which sounds like so much changing, is actually the chords. Yeah, even no, like getting more technical that, digitally. That's an excellent point because the way I, I look at things, uh, music, I think, the, the chord progression is everything. Mm -hmm. So if, if you guys want to be like like solid musicians, learn your chords. Because yeah. the, the, the chords change. You, you can have a, a one note mm -hmm. and you, you play, you're playing the same note. Or it'll, play sound like, like a, it'll sound like a different note. Exactly. Yeah. Because the context changes when the chord changes. Mm -hmm. And that's what uh, that's what the whole model theory thing is based on. Like uh, if you heard, um, and we're gonna talk about that in just a second. Um, like the whole pitch axis theory that Satriani talks about, which is really just it's just model theory, um, is based on context. So you can be playing the same line, and then the chords change, and then what the, that line means changes. Yeah. yeah so yeah, it's, is awesome. yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's really cool. Okay, so that's basically an example of, of how you take something like this and you simplify it and then you just, and that's what's called the, the tonal center approach. You find the tonal center and then uh, you play through it. So the way, the way I, would, I would do this is I would look for the first dominant seven chord, which is, in this case, G7 sharp five, right? So I know like it's an alter dominant chord, so it's gonna be the five of a minor key. And then it happens to resolve up a perfect uh, a fourth. It goes from G to a C. Right? Mm -hmm. So then, I don't, oh, okay, so C minor is just key. A, it's an altered seventh chord, so it's gonna be the fifth chord in any progression? In a, in a minor, in a minor in chord progression. Okay, yeah. so anytime you see an altered seventh, it's an gonna be the fifth. It's usually a minor key, yeah. 
Yeah. There are guys that, I mean, there are some songs that uh, break the rules, For as, sure. as you know, but but if, if we're just talking in general. Yeah, like trying to find key. Yeah. Like you flipping. An alter dominant chord, I suspect minor. Yeah. So then, then sure enough, it resolves to a minor, and then I work my way back, and this D flat, D minor 7 flat 5, happens to be the 2 of this minor key. So I just keep working my way back and find that all the chords fit the key, and I'm like, oh, okay, so this entire section, mm -hmm. I can play with this one scale. Right? Like I said, we're not going to talk about analysis, so, so I'm not, I'm not going to go in depth about this, but that's basically what I do. I essentially do analysis of the tune, and then I try to, I try to kind of put everything together. Okay, these are all the chords that fit in this key, and then I can play, and I can play freely. Now, there are, um, then we, we have the model approach, which is using the modes, and, and that kind of, especially in the um, late 80s and early 90s, there was kind of a craze about the modes. It was like this magical thing. And nothing in music is magical, it's just, yeah. it's just notes, right? So what the modes are, they're just, it's a, it's a reimagining of, of a particular pan scale. When people talk about D modes, they're talking about the modes of the major scale. So whenever you have, um, and actually the, the naming convention for all other modes comes from the modes of the major scale. So you're gonna see, you know, Dorian sharp something or you know, Phrygian flat something, right? Um, or sharp something, or natural something. Um, so it's, it's a good idea to, if you wanna study modes, to start with the modes of the major scale. And that's what's gonna give you, you know, the first mode is Ionian, which is the same as the major scale. Then you have Dorian, which is the second mode. So if, if you were to center the scale, start and end the scale in the, uh, on the second note, then you get Dorian. Now an important note there is, for teaching purposes, we say like if you start and end the scale on the second note is Dorian, if you start and end the, the scale on the third note is Phrygian, but context mar matters a lot. Yeah. Say that again. Chord, there's a minor chord under Phrygian, it's gonna sound very dark and more, more exotic and not as... Exactly. Yeah, like as dark as Phrygian can sound. You know? e exactly, yeah. And or if you're playing say like E Phrygian and I just play a C major seven behind you, yeah. No matter how hard you try to make that free jump sound. sound as cool, yeah. No, yeah. it's gonna sound like a major scale. Yeah, yeah, it's gonna yeah. sound like a major scale because the context is what so um there was an and I don't, I don't know who I heard say this, but I thought it was brilliant. So I, but I can't credit it because I can't remember who said it. But it, tonality destroys modality. Nice. So whenever whenever you have complex chord progressions, it's hard to stay in in a modal type setting. So when whenever when the modes work is when you have a static type chord. Mm -hmm. So like, if we look at modal jazz, something like So What by Miles Davis, where he just sits essentially on a D minor seven for something like 16 measures, and then plays E flat minor seven for eight measures, and then goes back to D, to D minor seven for another, I think, eight measures. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's 32, yeah. Um, that's, then that approach makes sense, because if I'm like, if I if I play, um, just like oh it's it's a D minor chord, so I'm gonna play in D minor. Well now you're gonna be playing the most boring solo in the world because you're yeah. sitting in one sound. Is that why most metal is pretty much model? E, yes. Like E power chord or open. Basically. Well, it's the other way around. Yeah. The other way around. It's because metal is so like one one tone, one yeah, note sure. kind of like being played. The whole song is the same. So then the solos have to be model because yeah, if you sure. don't. If you if you don't, I mean, you can play pentatonics for sure. Yeah. But but unless you, you know, spice it up mm -hmm. with some cool exotic scale, mm -hmm. it gets old really fast. Yeah, for sure. Like there's only so much groove metal. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So so that's kind of where so so that's really how it is. It's the other way around. Uh, and the same thing is true whenever you have static uh, chord changes. If you have a song that's just sitting on one note, and Santana does this too. Santana would play um, two minor chords. Um, a, um, a major second apart. And I'm outlining Dorian now. Yeah, which is almost like a refrain kind of thing. Yeah, yeah they play, they just, it's like looping a, you just play a, 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 two, a two chord vamp yeah. and then you have, you have the model sound. Mm -hmm. um, or um, I think, uh, I think it was Joseph Triani, he'd, he'd play like, a C, a C major seven, or C major nine chord, C major nine chord. And then this, 
like D, with an added 11, if you want to think of it that way, or a G major 7. I mean, it really sounds like a D something, so I would, I would call it D added 11. So once again, it's like that, that chord progression, or chord vamp, because it doesn't really go anywhere, it just yeah. stays in the same place. That, that chord vamp, it's, it's outlining a modal sound. So doing things like that repeatedly opens the door for you to play in a, a, in a modal way as opposed to uh, playing more tonally like we did earlier. So Eva, can you come over here? I don't know where you go away. You should just stay here. <laughs> You can play like over that. Of course, you can play um, major pentatonic. That was just fine. But you can also play. Whenever you have something like in so what, where you have just like one chord going over or the Santana thing mm -hmm. to make your solo a little bit more interesting, because mm -hmm. uh, then you kind of access those those sounds. Do you, do you
you have your hand up or are you just? No. Oh, okay. Thank you. Okay, okay. Okay, so then uh, the, the other approach that you see uh, often is uh, the chordal or the chord tone approach. And you see that a lot in like um, bebop, like that, that type of jazz, but you can also see it in, in rock. So like, you guys know Hotel California, right? So you have the chords are like B minor, F sharp major, A, E, G, D, E minor, and F sharp 11, right? Uh, or can you just play F sharp? Eleven sounds cool. <laughs> so I could take each one of those chords and just play with notes from the chord, from the arpeggio, when I play my guitar solo. Um, if I want to be cool, I just move my chords up an octave and down. I'm, but I'm essentially doing the same thing I'd be doing down here, right? So if I if I'm playing the um, go ahead, give me the first chord. So that so that uh, um, that sound that, that sound is, is valid and it still works in rock and simpler music. It doesn't have to be like bebop and and yeah. following you know it's really. Actually, there's a metal band called God Forbid that like all their. I was like, why does it sound so familiar? And I was like, oh, this is all heavy Hotel California. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, if you have if you have a if you have a rich chord progression, sometimes you can take advantage of that mm -hmm. um, by literally following the, the changes. Mm -hmm. That takes some practice, because you have to know your arpeggios and you have to, so, so all these things are predicated on uh, you guys internalizing some of those fundamental concepts that we learned in the beginning. Um, but I still think it's important to know about this because a lot of times you learn those things and you're like, why am I learning this? Mm -hmm. Like, why do I need to know arpeggios? When am I gonna use arpeggios? Why do I need to learn scales? Mm -hmm. You know, and, and uh, um, and like it's like we know we need them, we know we're supposed to use them, but we don't know like how or yeah. when sometimes. Yeah, when it fully clicks or applies. So yeah, so like our pages would be extremely useful in a situation like this. And then you can combine um, your knowledge of scales and your knowledge of arpeggios mm -hmm. um, to create lines that yeah. land on chord tones. Yeah. So you're if you're making a melody out of the notes in the arpeggio rather than the chord tones. Exactly. Yeah. And then there's one more. Oh yeah, motivic improvisation. So motivic improvisation is something that we also tend to do at the beginning of our guitar journey. And uh, I didn't really know that it was a thing or a complex thing until I uh, heard about this saxophone player called Ed Tomasi. Mm -hmm. And he's a, a Berkeley professor, so if you, yeah. So, uh, um, and he kind of went in depth about that stuff. And, but in, in a simple sense, all, the, all a motif is, it could be like two notes, or it could be a little sequence. It's just like a little something. So when you learn your pentatonic scale and you go like, you know, and just play that, that, that is a motif, or like what you're doing is a motif, yeah. right? So, and then you develop that motif into, into something else. And blues players are fantastic at this. They'll play one idea and they'll stick with it through all 12 bars, mm -hmm. you know, and, um, but then they keep adding little things so it's not boring. So it's not like that. I mean, re repetition is certainly something that they use, but they don't just sit there and repeat the same thing for 12 bars. Yeah. They keep dressing it up, sure. right? And they keep, yeah. they keep changing it. The interesting so, thing is you could consider being in, staying in one position actually being a motif. That's true too. Yeah. Yeah. yeah because you're, you you're, as you move, you're repeating those all the time. Yeah. Because then all you're doing is you're taking the idea and you're transposing it up, a note up the scale. In their case, it's a pentatonic scale, but it could be you're you're moving it by a by a fixed interval too, right? So it, and and that's what that's what's cool about that approach is that you're you're not 
bound by the core changes. I mean, in a way you are, because you have to hear what's going on and it has to work with what you're playing, but you're thinking more melodically. And you can combine that with say something like that, right? So now you're, you're combining the course to make it simple. So you have a giant space to use the scale. Or with the model approach, you have a chord that's sitting, so you have a giant space to play over the same mode, you're using the same scale. How do you make it interesting? So you create motifs, and then you develop them. So it's a very useful um, approach, and it's nothing more than just taking a, a little idea, really anything, and then developing it into something as the chords change and everything moves. Um, like all those shred lists are all motifs. Yeah. Like the whole, the yeah. Motifs. Yeah. All that stuff. Yeah. All the legs, legs <laughs> are motifs. Yeah. yeah. That you can then transpose and move around. For right. Sure. Yeah. So, and those, that's those do sound even if you just do it chromatically, they sound rad. Oh yeah, super cool. When you have something like yeah, yeah it's totally cool. Um, so yeah, so those are and there are other ways to approach improvisation, but those are the four ways that I, I think about, and I mean it's plenty to work on, I think. Um, so now that's kind of, that was kind of like a like an overview of everything. Um, so what can you do when you're when you're actually improvising? Well, something that you can do is um, you can take so say like. You're learning a song, and like let's go back to say arm lead. So we're, we have let's take those four chords. Right. So we have A minor, D seven, G major, C major. So notice that all the all the notes in the chord are are kind of sitting in the same little box. I'm right here in this in this second position. Right, so I have everything fits there, and then see all my notes are sitting there in the same box. Same box. Same box. So without me doing anything fancy or learning anything more than just the chords of the song, if I play the scale in that position, there you learn the major scale. Same C major scale that I, well, it's actually it's a different one, but same major scale. That G major scale, just by looking at the chord, right? So if the first chord is five, I'm skipping this one and then going five, 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 like that. And then if I play this note, and I tell you, is that chord, is that note in the chord, yes or no? Is it? Why, well, why not? Because the chord is like this. So that leaves that note out. Right? So you don't have to, um, and so like, and then, so then if we continue with the scale, is that not in the chord, yes or no? Yes. Yes, because you heard it in the chord. Right? And then you go here, is that not in the chord, yes or no? No, because there's nothing on this string that's in the chord. Right? And then this note is the chord, yes or no? <laughs> no. And then this note? So if you're trying to target a chord tone, then it's not right. So when so when we get to talking about things that work, yeah. that's when things it gets yeah. nebulous because there are a lot of things that work. For sure, yeah. So so in doing things like this, you don't have to figure out all the octaves. You don't have to figure out um, uh, a new finger in your arpeggio. No, you can use the chord as your guide. And then when you begin to play, you will na you naturally gravitate towards those those chord tones, and that's called uh, chord tone targeting. Mm -hmm. So you can play, you can play your line. And 
just just play the, the notes in the in the chord so the chord you can hear the chord inside your line and then when the when that changes using the chord tones to land and sort of like make your um, make your um, your improvised line cohesive with your chord progression so that's that's one approach mm -hmm. and it's something practical that you can do mm -hmm. uh, as you're learning songs and stuff like that just look at look at the chord shapes mm -hmm. and then if you know your scales you play the scale in that position and be like okay well what which ones which of these notes can I target? Mm -hmm. And then begin to experiment. Mm -hmm. And I mean, don't go perform on your first day. Right? <laughs> yeah, so it starts to become familiar with how it Exactly, works. yeah, you make the mistakes in the practice room, right? And mm -hmm. then, and but then, but that's a really good guide. Because then you immediately, you'll, you'll be able to tell, can I hear the chord there, the yes or no? And then you and listen. You could go through all the positions of C major too. Right? Yeah. Or C major. Absolutely, yeah, or yeah. And you, you should eventually play through the entire guitar. Mm -hmm. but. Don't make the mistake of thinking like, oh, I have to master everything, the whole guitar, before I start Come up with ideas. coming up with ideas or improvising. Okay. Um, if you know one position, if you know the notes in the open position, mm -hmm. you can improvise. Mm -hmm. Like you don't have to learn everything. That's a mistake I made. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, well, I don't know enough. Mm -hmm. I need to wait until like I know the whole guitar. Yeah. And so then my problem is I did the opposite. <laughs> and I just keep, I kept coming up with ideas, and it's like I don't know how to get the rest of it. And for me, it was like, well, you know, if I if I acquire enough knowledge and enough technique, then I'll be a good musician. Mm -hmm. And then years later, I had the technique and I had the knowledge and I still saw it. <laughs> so, so, so then I had to like figure out like, oh, well, I guess that wasn't it. So I had to, uh, um, and what, what I had to do was just create. And yeah, the first things that you do, just like when you write a story or anything, the first things that you do kind of suck, and then you, but you keep doing it, and you keep yeah. doing it, and you keep doing it, and you keep getting better and better and better. Yeah. It's like when you write a song. The first song you write is gonna be terrible, yeah. and then you write a hundred terrible songs, and then one good one comes out. Yeah, you know? you're basically being your own music producer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, so, and then uh, something else that you can do is the complete opposite. <laughs> so you can target chord tones, or you can avoid them deliberately. So, so something <laughs> that you can do. Um, and it works a little bit better with with context. So, um, say um, say you have you have an A minor chord. Can you just give me an A minor chord? No, A minor. Yeah, and, and give me like a full chord, not just a power chord. Okay. okay. So, I can sit on the ninth, for instance, and that's a that's a non chord tone. Like it's not in the chord at all. And play that, right? And use that as if it was my target. So, you sit there. And that creates like that feeling of like suspense of like, okay, okay, where is he going with that? You know? So, where, where chord tones create this sense of arrival when you play something, right? So, give me the same A minor. So you go, it's like, oh, okay, it, it's done. Resolution. That's what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. You can you can deliver you can create these things. Now, it's not random. Yeah. When you practice, 
you make this deliberately. So you so you sit down with your guitar and you play, and you're like, okay, I'm, I'm gonna target the chord tones, and then you practice that, and you know where the chord tones are by the time you're done. And then you're like, now I'm gonna avoid them. But you know where the chord tones are, so you can avoid them. Yeah, so you can resolve into them. And, and what that allows you to do is create um, like predictable outcomes, right? So, so you know like you're aiming for something. You're not just randomly playing. A big mistake that beginners make is like they, they play scales randomly over the chord. And because they, they work, right? it's like, oh, well, like in this case, right? I can, I can play C minor over that. I'm just gonna play C minor, the C minor scale randomly. And then some things will sound good, some things will sound bad, and you don't you don't know what you're doing. And yeah. you're, it's like saying random words mm -hmm. without really telling a story. Yeah, like they may have to do, they may relate to the subject, but they may just BS information. But <laughs> but if you but if you do these types of exercises where you're like, okay, now 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 I'm constrained. I, I have to hit target tones, or I have to hit chord tones, mm -hmm. or I have to avoid chord tones. Well, now you're doing something deliberately where you can do something wrong. Oh, I missed it. I didn't hit a chord tone. Oh, I missed it. I hit a chord tone, right? So, so it's trial and error in the way that you do it. Basically. <laughs> but but the, with the with the aim of getting more and more precise to where like when you want to, you hit a chord tone. Yeah. And if you want to avoid it, you can. Yeah. And then and you know specifically how each note makes you feel. For sure. Right? So because when you hit like say six or like in my case, like I love the ninth. But you hit a ninth consistently, you know what it sounds like, mm -hmm. you know what it feels like. So then when you hit it, you know what you're gonna get. It's like painting with a, with a color. Yeah. And then if the chord changes, and I hit a ninth, I know the ninth is gonna, against a minor chord, yeah. it's gonna consistently give me that sound. Mm -hmm. That sure. that sound over the... Yeah. I'm gonna get that, no matter what chord I'm playing. That's still a ninth. No matter where I, where I go, the ni a ninth is a ninth because it's a ninth against the chord, right? The same thing happens if I play a six, if I play a four. What if I play any one of the chord tones? Mm -hmm. So we should think of it also as intervals too over the chord, right? And then you'll feel, that's what that interval sounds like over that chord. Yeah. And that just the second yep. chord of that key. Yeah, sure. so, so when I teach music theory, like one of the, the first concepts that I talk about is intervals. Mm -hmm. And that's precisely the reason why. For sure. Because in intervals, that's like the, it's the smallest unit, right? So if you if you make it, and I don't know why I'm making this analogy because I'm not an artist at all, but but if you if you're drawing and painting, right, an interval is a line. It's like a straight line, right? Whereas a triad is more of a triangle. Now you're making shapes, mm -hmm. right? And then you have all the chords, you have all the shapes. Mm -hmm. And don't don't let me go any further because I don't know anything about <laughs> art. <laughs> but uh, but but yeah. So like the interval is the foundation. You can do a lot with that. And in, in, improvisation is no exception. Yeah, like knowing that a minor second is going to sound like Jaws. Wherever you are. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And, and having that, having those like, creating your own mental pictures of what these sounds are, it's, it's a great way. It's not consistent because everybody is, is going to be different. They're going to think something sounds different. If I show somebody, yeah. if I play something for somebody, mm -hmm. and I ask them, okay, wh what do you see? What story do you see here? They're going to tell me something. Yeah. Maybe elaborate. Mm -hmm. And I ask somebody else, and I tell something completely different. I feel like a lot of that would have to do with what phone soundtracks they used to. Yeah, and, and more, it has to do a lot with like your background, your cultural background, yeah, perception. And what, exactly. your perception. What stuff you hear in static sound that comes from Cassie songs. Right, exactly. Yeah. But, but it's I mean, not. Some, a lot of people, especially that grew up with Clint Eastwood movies, are going to associate a lot of sounds I think with the Wild West. Oh, yeah, yeah, like the, the okay, amount of chords. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um, let's see. So we have that, acidic improvisation, chord suspensions. Oh, yeah, melodic contour. So melodic contour, it's, that's going to tie into the intervals, right? You want to make sure that when you're playing something, you're not just playing the scale. I think I talked about this already. You don't want to just play the scale but you wanna create an interesting outline. That doesn't mean that you have to be jumping around all the time, mm -hmm. but put a couple of skips in there, you know? And once again, and having a target helps a ton with that. Mm -hmm. Cause like say, you know, you give yourself four notes and you might play, you know, instead of like your target is maybe this E note. Or like, let's take the B. That B note, right? 
right? And then I start all the way up here. Right? I had to do that because like I only had four notes. Right? So then I skipped a bunch of notes and landed there. Right? Um, and that that makes the line, even though it was going straight up, it's still more interesting than me just going forward. Just playing one note after the other. Do a sequence up to a note. Right. Yeah, so melody contour is important. Craft your melodies. Um, oh yeah, and then same thing. Internalizing these theoretical concepts ties into what we just talked about. Um, like when you learn a new word in a new, new musical word, like Dorian or you know Phrygian or Phrygian dominant or you know major seven sharp eleven, you know whatever. The, the word doesn't matter, it doesn't mean anything, unless you know what it sounds like. So you're a lot better off not knowing that, not knowing that this chord is a, major, is a C major seven sharp 11, but you know the sound, right? So then you score an accident one day, right? You play with your buddies and they're like, oh yeah, you remember that one cool chord I played? Yeah, man, just play that chord in C. Because you have the mental picture of the chord. Oh, yeah. Now, ideally, a certain color in the head. ideally, you want to know the name. Yeah. Because there's lots of cool chords out there, and then you're going to get mixed up yeah. eventually. Also, the producer is like, well, you have major seven, you don't know what the heck that is. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, if you're trying to work. So, right? the end of that producer trying to put so much into that song or that record. Right, yeah, yeah. yeah. Because they're going to tell you, go take a look at your fellow. That's true. Yeah, that's, that's, true. Actually yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's actually happened to me. Yeah, that's true. But, yeah, so, but, but, Having the sound go with the name is very important. That's a little bit like what uh, Richard Feynman said. Like, there's there's a big difference between knowing the name of something and actually knowing something. Mm -hmm. um, that applies to music, like in a big way. Like, <laughs> yeah. So, how do you take this stuff? Like, what? What do you, where do you go from here? Um, I think it's it's important to first of all, just don't be afraid to be creative. Just like sit down with your scales and say, even if, even if you feel like I know for sure I'm gonna do something wrong, do it, do it, be wrong. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter. You're only gonna get better. And so happy And developing creativity is the same way as developing technique or any other skill. You sit there and you practice it, and eventually it gets better. Um, and then, to help you along the way, something that you can do is learn these fundamental concepts, right? So like scales, like learn the scales in every position on the guitar. Learn your arpeggios in every position on the, the guitar. Learn as many chords as you can. Like, like learning chords should be a never-ending pursuit. Mm -hmm. There's so many chords on the guitar. So keep learning your chords and be exposed to new sounds, even if you hate them. Like I used to hate the seven flat nine chord. It's just like, I'm never gonna use that chord, it's so ugly, right? But it works, like you can use it in a, um, in a minor key. Yeah. Yeah, you can definitely use that chord. In context it works well. Solution, but it's fine. It works. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, so so just learn learn as much as you can and like internalize those sounds. Just like um, if you've been playing guitar for any like length of time, there are things that you can already do automatically. Like I know in your case, like the shape one of pentatonic, like mm -hmm. you can do that in your sleep, mm -hmm. right? And there are other things that you still have to think about. Mm -hmm. Well, practice those things until you don't have to think about it. Yeah, 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 until you don't have to think about them anymore, yeah, sure, yeah. right? And all that takes is repetition. So every day you practice, you you go for that, like transcend the technique, right? Go beyond the technique. So, um, so you don't have to think about it. And once you don't have to think about it anymore, it just kind of happens. Now you can create. Mm -hmm. yeah. So practice creativity, develop your knowledge. 
Um, there are some books there that I um, I think are great for developing. There's like a, a good three to five years of worth of study in that book recommendation list. Maybe more. The Tech Green books are pretty scary. Um, but I think it's it's worth it. It's And it's good to, if you don't have a guitar library, you should start building it. Even if you have a good teacher, it doesn't matter. Because there's a guitar what? Teacher. No, no. A guitar li library. library. Yeah. Like, start. Start. Like, of guitars or books? <laughs> books. Guitars. <laughs> 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 I am Bob and I don't. Yeah. <laughs> you know, vices. That's how my loved ones would say. <laughs>